Old Testament and the New Man, Genesis through Joshua with Dr. Daniel Canty. As the modern order enters its apparent sunset, Dr. Canty looks anew at the ancient scriptures to learn what they teach about man and his world. Here he is with today's episode. Hello, I want to welcome everybody to this first full-length episode of the Old Testament and the New Man. I'm your teacher, Daniel Canty, and today we're going to be getting into the scripture in earnest as opposed to the orientation that I did a little bit ago, the uh, the first brief, um, brief episode. Now we're going to be getting into the early chapters of Genesis today, going over Genesis chapter 1. So before we get into the scripture itself, I want to say a couple of things about the way that I'm looking at these early chapters of Genesis. And uh, after we do that, we'll, we'll get into the scripture itself. So first of all, how did the fathers read Genesis? Which is to say, did they read it as history or as myth, symbol, or allegory? Well, clearly they read it as history but not only as history. So yes, they did take symbolic meanings from the early chapters of Genesis. They also took allegorical meanings from the early chapters of Genesis. This kind of reading or interpretation of the early chapters is pretty common among the fathers. But that's not to say that they didn't see it as history. They did see it as history. And so for us, when we think about Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2 and 3, do we as modern people think of these things historically? Well, yes, I think as people of faith and people who are trying to follow the Christian life and live according to a Christian author ethos, yes, we have to see them historically. They are not mythological stories that were given to us just for our betterment that may have these really wonderful or profound or insightful things to say about human nature or the nature of reality, while at the same time not being real, not being part of human history. We have to see them historically as the fathers did. And I bring up this point because we are now in a time where there are folks out there who are trying to figure out how it is that the world becomes what they call re-enchanted, that the world has become disenchanted, which means that we no longer see spiritual powers or realities at work in it. All of the things that have to do with, say, angels and demons or spirits or God in some cases, those have all been removed. Miracles have been removed. And so we have this world that's disenchanted. And how do we re-enchant it? How do we put those things back? Well, make a statement or make a claim on that particular score. The ancient world was one which saw, when I say the ancient world, I'm thinking about the early church, although you could apply it more broadly. The ancient church, the ancient world was one which understood there to be a spiritual reality. And whatever was infinite, whatever was eternal, was in that reality. That's where you experienced the things that were without bound. And there was rest in that particular world, that there is a God, there is meaning, there is a life beyond this one that gives purpose to this one. But in the modern world, we've lost a sense of that at the same time that we have imported the notion of the infinite into our daily lives, that we are now infinite possibility creatures, creatures who are a law unto ourselves and at the same time capable of an infinite number of choices. And so the infinitude that was lodged in another world is now in this one. And we cease to rest in that world. We cease to have faith in that world. And... It is not surprising that we, as a culture, as a civilization, doubt or no longer have faith in the historicity of the texts that invite us to experience the infinite as the eternal, to experience it as something beyond our day-to-day -day experience because it has acted in that experience historically. So when I look at, the, at these chapters in Genesis, these open and cha opening chapters, I say to myself, yes, they are historical. Yes, they are given to us so that we may have faith in them, that we may rest in them, not only as allegories that tell us wonderful things that, or tell us really interesting things, rather, about human nature. They, they are that. They are allegorical. But they are no less real for that. And if we are going to, again, walk the Christian walk, to walk according to the ethos of faith, we have to look at the scriptures with the ethos of faith 
as the fathers did. So as I move through these stories, as I take a look at what happens in Genesis 1, as I see what happens in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, my fundamental disposition here is that these things are real. Not only do they have moral lessons or spiritual lessons for us, but they tell us things that actually occurred. And that kind of intellectual sacrifice, uh, as the modern sociologists call it, that kind of intellectual sacrifice is common for orthodoxy, thanks be to God. Uh, but it's harder for people who are in the broader Western culture to come to this. And I just want to make it clear that I stand very firmly within that orthodox tradition, that ancient tradition, for how the scriptures are to be viewed. And my, uh, my larger critique in response to those who would have questions about it is a story about how we came to the position of faithlessness. And elements of that story may come out as we go through this series of lectures. But I, I want everybody here who's listening to know that I, I have that kind of view towards the scriptures as we move through them. The second thing that I want to say, and this has more particularly to do to Genesis, with Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, I, I want to drive home the importance of the, the overarching motifs of work and rest. These are the driving concerns of the text for the first couple of chapters as I'm going to look at it and as I believe they are in the text itself. And it's very, very important to get this point because I'm going to be talking about freedom and where freedom shows up in some interesting places in Genesis chapter 1 here in a few minutes in particular. But Genesis chapter 1 is not about freedom. It's about God creating, that is God working, God giving form to things that were not yet until he made them. And along that path of God giving form, of God creating and making the things that he wanted to make, there are points of freedom. There are very interesting appearances of freedom in a particular manner um, that I'm going to explain here soon and I think you all will find interesting. But that's a subordinate motif. The really important themes are work and rest. Freedom punctuates those notions or, or those larger motifs of work and rest. So we're going, to, we're going to go through the story, but I want you all to have that in your back pocket as we move through it. I'll, I'll come back to it again a little bit further on, um, further on as, we, as we move through. So <clears throat> the six days of creation, how should we see them? What are they? Are they events that exist according to our physical laws as we know them? Can we take the physical laws that we have in this particular time, laws of physics, laws of gravity, uh, various other laws that are observable about the world that we know now, and can we project those back into the six days and say, well, this is how it happened? Well, clearly not. What's going on in the six days are six miracles. And modern science, the rules of modern science, don't have much to say to us about how the creation happened according to the works of God parlayed to us in the biblical story. And I'm going to read a little bit here from Father Seraphim Rose from uh, Genesis Creation and Early Man, who sums up this point pretty well. No scientific theory, Father Seraphim says, can tell us about those six days. Science tries to explain, sometimes with more and sometimes with less success, the changes of this world based on projections of natural processes that can be observed today. But the six days of creation are not a natural process. They are what came before the world's natural processes began to work. They are God's work. <clears throat> By very definition, they are miraculous and do not fit into the natural laws which govern the world we see now. If we can know what happened in those six days at all, it is not by scientific projections or speculations, but only by God's revelation." End quote. So when we look at what was happening during these days, we have to set aside all of our descriptions and our explanatory apparatus for how the physical world works around us and understand that we are seeing, the mir we are seeing miracles that are as miraculous as Christ's healings or his casting out of demons, or his walking on the water. That this is the kind of thing that we are reading about. And so the expectation that there are going to be these physical laws there, and they will explain to us exactly what is happening, is to misunderstand the divine nature of what we are encountering as we go into this text. <clears throat> to uh, continue with Father Seraphim, 
During the six days, nature itself was being made. Our present knowledge of natural laws cannot possibly tell us how these laws themselves were made. The very subject of ultimate origins, of beginnings, of the genesis of all things is outside the sphere of science. So the notion that you have this scientific predictability, this predictability that allows us to manipulate the, uh, the physical world and to make all the technological things that we have made, that, that, the, that series of laws applies here is erroneous. Again, what we are looking at is the time when those laws were being made, the time when the world was being created according to processes that really only God knows with any kind of detail and that we don't know beyond what we have been told in the scripture. <clears throat> to give only one brief example, we have grass growing on day three before there is a sun on day four. So how exactly that would happen, we don't really know other than to say it is a miracle. There was light, but we don't know exactly what kind of light it was. Certainly it was not sunlight. So just to, uh, just to give one example of that. Okay, so now into the text itself. In the beginning, God made heaven and earth. And, and by the way, I'm going to read all of chapter 1, and then we'll go back and, and walk through it. In the beginning, God made heaven and earth. The earth was invisible and unfinished, and darkness was over the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning one day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water and let it divide the water from the water. And it was so. Thus God made the firmament and God divided the water under the firmament from the water above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning the second day. Then God said, let the water under heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. The water under heaven was gathered into its places, and the dry land appeared. So God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the herb of grass, bearing seed according to its kind and likeness. Let the fruit tree bear fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind on earth. It was so. Thus the earth brought forth the herb of grass, bearing seed according to its kind and likeness. The fruit tree bore fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind on earth. God saw that it was good. So evening and morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven for illumination to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be for illumination in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth. It was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So evening and morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters bring forth creatures having life and let birds fly above the earth across the face of heaven's firmament. And it was so. Thus God made great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on earth. So evening and morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, the quadrupeds, the creeping things, the wild animals of the earth according to their kind. It was so. God made the wild animals of the earth according to their kind, the cattle according to their kind, and all the creeping things on earth according to their kind. God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of heaven, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that moves on the earth. So God made man in the image of God. He made him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
Then God said, Behold, I have given you every seed-bearing herb that sows seed on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. I also give every green plant as food for all the wild animals of the earth, for all the birds of heaven, and for everything that creeps on the earth, in which is the breath of life. It was so. Then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So evening and morning were the sixth day. And here to finish the story, we'll go into the first few verses of chapter 2. Thus heaven and earth and all their adornment were finished, and on the seventh day God finished the works he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the works he made. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his works God began to make. So these are the days of creation as they are given to us in Genesis chapter 1. And we begin going back to the first verse. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was invisible and unfinished, and darkness was over the deep. This is from the Septuagint. The Masoretic text says that the, that the earth was formless and void. And we are introduced here to a particular thing that we won't typically think of, that we don't really emphasize very much in the biblical story, and that is the idea of formless matter. When God creates the earth, the very first thing that there is is formlessness. And please forgive me, I'm going to get a little abstract here for a second. But what is formless matter? How do we even think of it? I'm going to borrow here from St. Augustine, who actually discusses this in book 12 of his Confessions. He's writing about the creation, and here's what he says about formless matter. Lord, have you not taught me that before you imparted form and distinction to that formless matter, there was nothing, no color, no shape, no body, no spirit, yet not nothing at all, no, not that either, but there was some kind of formlessness with no differentiation. Whatever it was, he says, it was, quote, invisible and unorganized. And St. Augustine calls this formless matter a something-nothing, or an is that is not. It's a really interesting question. How can something be without having any form that defines it as what it is? So we may imagine in our minds a kind of primal soup or you know, maybe a, maybe a ball of Play-Doh or something like that. But even the soup or the Play-Doh have form. They have some kind of form. They're clearly ready to take form. The ball of Play-Doh is a ball. And the soup is already in the, uh, the stage of water, the stage of some liquid, that it is prepared to take whatever form it is given, and we can see it. But this formless matter, it's a mist. It's a something-nothing, as St. Augustine says or an is that is not, a something that has being, and yet that being is arguably just a pure state of becoming, that it is always changing, it is mutability, something that is, that is always in a process of redefinition, of mutating itself, of becoming something different while not becoming anything at all. What I would like for you all to remember is that this formless matter is a kind of freedom. It is a pure possibility. It is something that is not yet defined and thereby not limited by definition, but is completely and totally unrestrained by the appearance of form and in this sense, free. The other point that I would like to make about it is that this freedom is couched within a vector or a movement towards form. God is creating. All right, there's a mutability there. There's a changeability there. But he is in the process of giving form to the world, to the cosmos that he is going to create. And so this formlessness, even though it is completely free, is still at the same time kind of like a womb, kind of like something that is going to give birth to form, give birth to life, give birth to the various parts of the creation that we're about to see. And in that sense, it's very positive. In that sense, it's a, it's a movement upward if you will, from absolute nothingness, which is you know, really unthinkable for us, um, a movement upward from absolute nothingness towards the beauty and the harmony, the excellence and the goodness of all the things that God creates. So please take that moment of freedom, you know, that moment of formlessness, right at the very beginning of creation here, 
and uh, just remember it. We'll come back to it. So continuing on, continuing on. The darkness was over the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and there was evening and morning one day. So the first day, if I were to ask all of you what was created, well, there was a division, a division of light and darkness. The light is created, let there be light, and there it is, and now we have light and dark, and this light and dark form an evening and a morning, and so we have one day. The second day, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water, God says, and let it divide the water from the water. And it was so. Thus God made the firmament, and God divided the water under the firmament from above, from the water above the firmament. And he called the firmament heaven, and God saw that it was good, and there is the second day. So what we have here is another division, the lower waters and the upper waters. But this division creates creates essentially the sky on the one hand, right, the heavens, the waters above, and the seas, or rather the water below. We'll, we'll see that they're going to be gathered together in a minute. But we have the waters above and the waters below. So on day one, there's light and darkness. On day two, there are waters above and waters below. All right, so there are different realms, as it were, different uh, spaces now that are being created. We'll see exactly how that applies in just a moment. Going on to day three. Then God said, let, water, let the water under heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. The water under heaven was gathered into its places and the dry land appeared. So God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And I wanna stop right here for just a moment. On this third day, Instead of having simply waters above and waters below, we have the waters below gathered together and differentiated from the land. It's really the land that appears here. So on day one, we have light and darkness. On day two, we have skies and seas. And then on day three, we have the land that first appears. What's really interesting about these first three days, other than the fact that God is making these realms, as we're going to see, is the verbs that we see for God's creating. On day one and day two, God divides. On day three, he gathers. Right, these are the, the, the verbs that we see linguistically in the, uh, in the text. This double division followed by a gathering actually is an echo of what happens within the Trinity. That God begets the Son, which is a kind of division, that a second person is now there, logically speaking. God proceeds, or rather the Spirit proceeds from the Father, which is another kind of multiplication or division, an addition uh, of something new according to the logic of the Trinity, the, uh, what's called the uh, relations of origin. And so there is this division that happens twice. But these three figures are not left alone. They're not meant to be distinct, uh, sort of, you know, uh, isolated, you know, self-dwelling sort of, uh, or, you know, neutrally dwelling or independent figures, but rather they are gathered together from their respective essences in the life that we know by saying God is love. And so there are two divisions that make three persons, but those three persons come back together in the life of love that is constitutive of the Trinity. And we see a very faint echo of that, a very faint reminder of that, we might say, in these first three days of creation, where God is making these different locales, these different spaces in the cosmos. So let's go on. Continuing on with day three. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the herb of grass, bearing seed according to its kind and likeness. Let the fruit tree bear fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind on earth. And so we have grass, and we have fruit trees, and God saw that it was good. So there's evening and morning the third day. And this is the first form of life that God creates here on the third day. So, going on to day four. 
Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven for illumination to divide the day from the night. Let them be for the signs and seasons and for the days and years. Let them be for illumination in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth. So there's two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, that would be the sun. The lesser light to rule the night, that would be the moon. <clears throat> so uh, the moon and the, the stars as well are made. So where did the moon and the stars go? Well, the sun is the greater light that rules over the light. And so the sun is placed in the light in that particular sphere. The moon and the stars, on the other hand, the moon being the lesser light that rules over the darkness, are placed in the sphere of the darkness. And so the spaces that we saw created on day one, the light and the darkness, now have entities that populate them. Now there is the sun that goes into the light, and now there is the moon and stars that goes into the darkness. So there's a kind of connection between day one and a little bit later on, day four. All right, God makes the spheres on day one, he puts their beings, or he puts, he puts the proper inhabitants, shall we say, the proper inhabitants into those spheres on day four. Let's go to day five. Then God said, let the waters bring forth creatures having life and let birds fly above the earth according to the face of heaven's firmament. And it was so. Thus God made great sea creatures and every living thing that moves within the waters according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. So here on the fifth day, we have fish, and we have birds. Interestingly enough, these are the creatures that populate the spheres that were divided out on day two. So in day two, you have the waters above and the waters below. You have the sky and you have the sea. Now on day five, you've got the birds that go in the sky and the fish that go in the sea. So on day one and day two, there are places that are created. And we, you know, we don't normally think of light and darkness as a place, but in this particular creation story, they are. They are places. And then day four matches day one, where the inhabitants go to their places, to the uh, light and darkness that were created in day one. And here in day five, the inhabitants go to their places. The fish and the birds go in the, uh, in the sea and in the sky. So you have realms that are made, and then those realms are populated. So those of you who are paying pretty good attention can guess what's going to be made on day six, right? Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, the quadrupeds, the creeping things, and the wild animals of the earth according to their kind. It was so. So God made the wild animals of the earth according to their kind, and cattle according to their kind, and all creeping things on earth according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. I'm going to stop right there. Then on the sixth day, we have land animals created. So the land is created on day three. That's the new realm, the new sphere, the new place. And then we have the land animals, including man, uh, made male and female. We have them on day six. So there's another realm. And then there are inhabitants for the realms. So God is creating, but his creation comes in two phases, making the spheres, making the places, and then putting the inhabitants in their places. And this is a general rule. It is not entirely without exceptions. After all, the grass is made on, third, on the third day. So it's not like what we would call an absolute rule. I mean, there, there is a, there's a kind of qualification to it, which is important to know. But in general, the general rule is that God makes a place and then he puts the thing its place. And we will see when we get to the story of the creation of Israel that there is a place, the promised land, and the people are going to go to that place. And we'll see in Genesis chapter 2, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more than we see here, there's a place, the Garden of Eden. And God makes Adam and Eve and he puts them in their place. And the places are good, and the things being in their places is good. And so God is working. He is forming things. But this process of forming, this process of bringing to life and of making harmony and goodness is to make places and then to put things where they go. So uh, it's a little cliche to say it, I guess, but all things in their proper places. This is the basic lesson that we get from the creation of the first six days in Genesis. That where a person is, or... Uh, 
where a thing is, we might say more broadly with this creation, is important. Fish don't belong in the sky. Birds don't belong in the sea, as a general rule. Right? Human beings, they're on the land. That's where the quadrupeds are. That's where man and woman are. Right? The sun doesn't belong in the uh, the sun doesn't belong at night. The moon doesn't belong in the day. Right? Generally speaking, there are lesser lights and and uh, and greater lights that have their proper places. Again, not to say that there aren't certain exceptions. I mean, you know, you'll you'll see the moon out in the day every once in a while. But we know, according to the biblical story, that the moon is what rules over the night. That is its proper place. That it is where that's where it's meant to be. Not to say that it can't be and can't be out in the daylight, but still, it's where it's supposed to be at night. And the sun is out during the day, not at night. So, let's get to human nature. What we have to see. What we have to see about human nature here. Picking up, picking up with these verses. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of, the er uh, birds of heaven, and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that moves on the earth. So God made man. In the image of God, he made him male and female. He made them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And all these things are given to man. And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So evening and morning were the sixth day. Back to this statement, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, God says. The hour here is understood as a kind of Trinitarian monologue, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit speaking to one another. But there's a difference between the image and the likeness in the teaching of the fathers. According to their teaching, the image cannot be lost. The image is something which stays with us always. But it is the likeness which can change. The likeness which can become, which we can lose, as it were, or at least diminish, or we can grow. Yeah. So... Here I'm going to read from uh, St. Basil the Great. <clears throat> and this is quoted by uh, Father, Father Seraphim Rose. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, says St. Basil. We possess the one by creation. That's the image. We acquire the other by free will. In the first structure, it is given to us, in the first structure, it is given, to, given us to be born in the image of God. By free will, there is formed in us the being in the likeness of God. Let us make man in our image. Let him possess by creation what is in the image, but let him also become according to the likeness. God has given the power for this. If he had created you also in the likeness, where would your privilege be? Why have you been, why have you been crowned? And if the creator had given you everything, how would the kingdom of heaven have opened for you? But it is proper that one part is given you, while the other has been left incomplete. So it, <clears throat> this is so that you might complete it yourself and might be worthy of the reward which comes from God. When Adam and Eve were created, prior to their fall, they had the image of God, but they were striving through obedience, through the orientation of their mind towards the divine things, and by their submission to the divine, divine commands, towards the fullness of the likeness of God. Here we see an instance of the importance, again, of freedom. In this case, free will. Free will, not necessarily that would be defined as formlessness, which we saw earlier. Although, again, it's still a kind of pure possibility. The possibility of saying yes to God and being obedient doing his will, gathering all of one's faculties and all of one's mental powers towards dwelling in God's presence, in thanksgiving, in gratitude, in submission towards him, or of turning away from that, falling away from it, and choosing the path of sin. So there is a kind of unrestrained possibility here. You can make the great choice towards God, or you can make the great choice away from him. 
And again, we find this freedom, we find this possibility nestled within a vector towards form. All of creation in all of its goodness and the life that has been given and the command of God push the people who have been created. They gently pressure Adam and Eve towards being obedient. In other words, there are motivations to continue to do right. <laughs> There's joy. There's the fact that the earth is there and provides for one, that there's, there's food to eat. There is this dominion that has been given. There's this glory that's been given. The image of God has been given. So clearly there is motivation to continue along the path of obedience to strive for that greater form, which is life incorrupt, incorruptible life. Now, Adam and Eve don't take that path because their freedom was strong enough and maintain the possibility of them saying no. And so we have, at the beginning of the process of creation, a moment of freedom, a moment of formlessness, something unrestrained by form. Then towards the end, we have another moment of freedom, a moment where there is a pure possibility that while there are gentle pressures in one direction or another towards God, those can be overcome. People could fall. The freedom is significant. It is meaningful. One at the very beginning and one at the very height, metaphorically speaking, at the very height of the sixth day and at the very height of creation. Inasmuch as God desires communion to dwell within his creation that bears his image. <clears throat> now, after these six days comes the seventh day. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus heaven and earth and all their adornment were finished. And on the seventh day God finished the works he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the works he made. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his works. God began to make. The seventh day is the day that is holy and that is sanctified because it is the day of rest. And what does this rest mean? It means that all things are in their places and all things are good and they are as God created them to be. It's not to say that they never work. After all, God himself has worked. <clears throat> Rest presumes work. But all of those things are as God designed them. All of the creation is as he willed it to be. And so there is rest as he, as God steps back from his labors. And this rest we are going to see is the giving of life. That life happens with rest and not without rest. This is the high point as it were, of all the creation is the rest after it, seeing all that is very good and resting. A rest, again, that does not happen apart from work and which is not without work and which is in balance with work. The overarching themes of Genesis 1 are work and rest. They involve placing things in their proper places which have been created. First the spheres are made, then the spheres are inhabited by those things which are meant for them. What's really fascinating about all of this, I think, is that we're going to see something very similar with the creation of Israel when we get to it. What we have is a process of work, as it were, towards rest in the promised land. But interestingly, the moments of freedom that we see towards the beginning and towards the end here of this process of creation, they're going to be replaced after the fall with these very peculiar near-death moments. So instead of freedom here and freedom there, it's near-death here and near-death there. Because one of the most puzzling things about the creation of Israel, one of the most fascinating things, is that along the way towards getting his people into their place, repeatedly, those people almost die. They come under such great pressure at one time or another that it is like death, or they are nearly sacrificed as a people. 
And so there is this really fascinating dynamic for how this happens. And as we think about what it is to be the new man, this is, after all, a course on the Old Testament and the new man. When we think about what it is to be the new man, what it is to become the Christian and to live the spiritual life, there is a repetition of moving through death moments. There is a repetition of a kind of figurative death that people walk through uh, liturgically at the, at the Eucharist. Or even in various other ways we could potentially argue. But we have a movement towards rest as well in our own lives, towards the rest of eternal life. So, that's it for the first episode, and I will see you all next time. The Old Testament and the New Man, Genesis through Joshua with Dr. Daniel Canty. Dr. Canty taught religion and philosophy at Bethel University from 2012 to 2019. He is a graduate of Yale Divinity School and Emory University and lives with his family in Clarksville, Tennessee. This has been a listener and viewer-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio.